Yes, I'm going to talk a bit about the first contact. Uh, whoever thought of you thought it's about this first contact has now the chance to leave the room. I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, I'm going to talk about things like that. Um, registration forms. Um, why the first contact? Well, your registration form or your order form actually is the first contact a possible customer has with your website. Well, they're on the website before, aren't they? But to be honest, everything else, everything before that is just advertisement. You have a nice, shiny website, and as soon as you get to the registration process, that's the point where, well, where we actually talk business. Um, yeah, who am I? Uh, you already introduced me. I'm a kind of regular speaker at conferences. I, I'm actually a software developer at a company uh, called BitExpert. Uh, I do co-organize a user group. I uh, created PHP.UG. Uh, I'm involved in calling all papers. I do maintain open source stuff and whatnot. Before I start, I want to give you a, a short disclaimer. This is a rant. I'm not a UX person. I am a PHP developer. I'm a backend developer, actually. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, uh, and I can't write, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just a user. I'm just a person that has to use these registration forms. And this is most of the time just what I encountered and what just doesn't make sense. Uh, and yes, uh, high school of street knowledge and whatnot. What am I going to talk about? Or what, what, do I, what do I want to show you? Some examples. This, for example, is a registration form. I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of you already have seen that uh, and already have forgotten about it. Um, this is a not so nice example. This is a pretty cool example, actually. I'm pretty sure every one of you has used that one and already forgotten about it. And this is also a pretty cool one. Um, also, I think most of you have used that one. Uh, one that most of you probably haven't used is this one. So which of these three would you, uh, which of these four would you like to actually use? I'm pretty sure this is not number one. Um, <clears throat> a short side note, um, if, I'm pretty sure there will be some questions. Um, the times I did this talk before, um, it happened that from these questions there was a very great discussion uh, evolving, but that would just uh, kill the time limit we have here. So please talk to me afterwards, and then we have a great discussion about that. So what is the, for me, the most, or one of the annoying things here is um, they are calling for a first name and a second name. So let's start with names. Who of you has ever thought about names? I'm pretty sure most of you do a name field or do something like this when they have to uh, require a question a name from a person. Give me a given name, give, you, give me your family name. Who hasn't? Well, OK. So for my name, that is pretty easy. First, um, <clears throat> given name is Andreas, family name is Heigl. Perfect, yeah. What about this person? Uh, this is Professor Dr. Dr. H.C. Meinrad Wolfgang Fürst zu Erbach Fürstenau. Well, um, this professor is actually part of the name, but it's not the given name. So the given name would be, well, Meinrad Wolfgang. OK, that would fit. And the family name would be, yeah, well, actually, it's just Erbach Fürstenau. So this person would have to butcher his name just for your form. OK, but not really nice. And uh, what about this person? Or this person? Who of you knows the, the, the upper one? Björk Gutmann does the year. Um, that is not a, it is a second name, but it's not a family name. Gutmann's dot here is a father's name. Also Bin Osman. Bin Osman means I'm Isa, the son of Osman. The, upper, uh, the, the one above is I'm Björk, the daughter of Gutmund. So this Guthmund's dot here and Bin Osman is not a family name. It's, a, well, something else. OK, so let's do it a different way. Let's say first name, last name. That's, that's OK. That should work, shouldn't it? 
Um, well, <clears throat> uh, okay, uh, no. This is a common name in uh, uh, um, Saudi Arabia, uh, in, in Muslim countries. Um, it's uh, I'm Abu, father of Muhammad, the beautiful, son of uh, Abdulaziz, the Palestinian. Okay, so which part do we fit where? Uh, or what about this lady, Madurai Mani Iya? In this case, Madurai is actually the village that woman comes from. Mani is actually the name of the person, the given name, and Iya is the caste name. That's a typical Indian name. Doesn't fit. And what about this one? Who of you knows that person? I'm pretty sure most of you know. Uh, that's the writing, uh, this writing is uh, pronounced Mao Zedong. So in this case, we have a first name, which is Mao. But actually, Mao is the family name. So if you put that into first name, you don't get what you want. Which brings me to exactly that. What do we actually want? First, what do we take, uh, take from that? There might be no family name. <clears throat> there might be no middle initial, looking at those American people. And the main question is, is it actually necessary to know how that name is split up? Do we need that? And if so, why? Um, so instead, why do we not just use one field? Please give me your name. And then you can put in whatever you want. And yes, that might be long input. Um, th there is this wonderful sketch from, uh, uh, from Monty Python uh, with this uh, gumball, putty, whatever, uh, Bahnwagen Fahrer of Ulm, uh, which is a name of, I don't know, a thousand characters or something like that. Yes, it is a sketch, but still, there might be long input. And there might also be non ascii input, whether that's just German umlauts, or French accents, or, uh, well, <clears throat> Mao Zedong, Chinese names. So if you have Chinese names, you might perhaps want to use a transcription field if you need to know how the name is pronounced or transcribed into our language or the language that you are using. And please also clearly label your fields, which means, for example, use something like previous name instead of maiden name. It's not only women that change their name. And I'm not the only one thinking about that. Actually, um, the, the World Wide Web Consortium uh, thought about that, and that's where I took all that stuff from. So what's next? What usually comes uh, if people want to split up the name field? Yeah, well, but we want to know how to address that person. We want to write a letter to dear Mr. Smith or dear Mrs. Smith. Which brings us to the next thing, gender. Um, yep, yeah, there is male and there's female and by now we know there might be something else. Um, gender is definitely not binary. So also having a field in your database like male, yes or no, ah, uh, no which does not mean the male, but uh, you know what I mean. So the main question is, do you actually need the gender? And if you need it, what do you need it for? Is it marketing that want to address Mrs. Smith? Well, ask for pronouns, for example. That might be a possibility. Or just add a field. Hey, how do you want to be addressed? And then the person can put in whatever they want. And I'm pretty sure if they want to add, uh, they would want to put in Superman in here, they will grin every time they get a newsletter to Hi Superman. <laughs> and that's okay. You don't need that, actually. <coughs> also, have a look here. Okay, so we have a gender, we have an, a name. What do we need most of the time also? We need emails. 
Uh, that is one of the points uh, where I think this form is a bit weird. Because um, <coughs> do they think I'm stupid? Do they actually think I'm stupid? I'm so stupid that I can't write my email twice? That, that I have to write my email twice? That I can't get it right on the first try? I mean, in the password field, that's OK, because I can't see what I type in, usually. But hey, really? There is no need to request the email address twice. Um, because you don't ask them for their physical address twice, do you, if you want to ship something to them? Well, sometimes that would be helpful. My wife just recently had that because uh, they got a parcel back because she wrote the address wrongly. But no one does that. Because you will send an opt-in email anyway. There is no other way around, uh, at least in Europe, uh, by now. And uh, people will notice whether they entered the wrong email address or not. Well, now you might say, um, uh, of course, allow the people to change the email address. Now you might say, yeah, well, but what when during the registration process that doesn't work and that's far too complicated to have the possibility to change the email address during that? Well, actually, no, it's not. Uh, just, just a few days ago, I uh, had to register for open cage data. And I, of course, I uh, entered the email address and uh, clicked on the, on the button and was like, hey, that's cool. That's really nice. Please check the link uh, in the email we've sent to, yes, the email address. And you did not receive the email. Well, then either resend it because whatever, gray listing and stuff like that, or change the email address because you suddenly realize, oh, one F too much or too less or whatever. That's a cool way. And you definitely don't need to think or to, to give the, the customer the impression that you think they are stupid. They will realize here. <laughs> and one of the things I notice uh, that doesn't count for these things, uh, but when you have a contact form on your website and, uh, or you have an order and you uh, request an email address, please always send a copy of what you are sending via email also to the user. Nothing is worse than writing a well-crafted message into a contact form and hitting send and gone. Yes, they, the, the addressee gets whatever you wanted, but you don't know what you wrote after a week. So keep that in mind. There is also some reference to that, whatever. OK, I think we've addressed almost all the important things. But then a few things creep up very regularly. One of these is dates. Yes, I'm very fond of dates. I'm not going to talk about that. Don't worry. Um, there is an RFC, and um, I'm going to leave it there. If you request a date, try to make it RFC compatible, or at least store it in that way. Um, if you order it from the least precise to the most precise, it is very easy to understand. So that means year, month, day, hour, minute, second. You can, for, for the date, you can do it the other way around as well. It works also, so that means date, a day, month, and year. Please do not mix up month, day, year, which is completely nonsense. <laughs> but if you request a date, please make sure that you tell me what you expect me to insert. If you request it to be month, day, year, please tell me so in advance. And the best th thing is use input type equals date. There is a form field for that, so use it. Uh, or if you can't use that, use a date shim or whatever, date picker, whatnot. Um, and then we come to validation. Please, please, please validate fault tolerant. Even though you told me to insert dd.mm.yyyy, I might enter 1.12.2001. And that is not wrong. Just, I, I just skipped the initial zero. I'm sorry about that. But that still is a valid date, and you know what I, want, what I meant. So please do not give me that as an error. But the main question is, what do you need a date for anyway? I mean, if you, if you want a shipping date, I, I, I'm not the person telling you when you can ship my items. Usually not. Um, 
So something like ASAP is okay, but most of the times it's about birth dates. People want your birthday, my birthday. What do they need it for? Do they want to send me a birthday email? Well, interesting idea, but um, we come to that later. But most of the time it's for age verification. Well, who of you has in their whole life never ever faked a birth date? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> you get the picture, yes? Uh, so why not add something like this? Just a checkbox. Yes, I am legally entitled to buy beer because that is what you're talking about. Otherwise, you have to do the maths. And this is a very, very weird thing. I haven't seen that anywhere so far. Um, but I mean, we are using checkboxes uh, in, yes, I've read the terms and conditions. So why not this? If that doesn't work, as I said, I'm not a lawyer. If that doesn't work, there are enough other wa uh, ways to, to verify your, uh, uh, an age by uh, using a, a personal ID card or uh, bank accounts or whatever. Um, so if you want an age verification, do exactly that, an age verification, and don't ask me for a birthday. There are also some references. I'll skip those. You can uh, go through them if you want to go through the slides later on. As I said, birthday. People want a birthday usually. Um, that brings me to required fields. Which fields are required? A required field is a field that you need to actually provide your requested service. So if you want the birthday for the marketing to send you an email, address, uh, an email on your birthday, that's usually not the service you're providing. So everything that you do not explicitly need should not be a required field. And if you have required fields, clearly mark them as such. An asterisk uh, is by now a de facto standard. You can do something else, put in, in brackets, required, whatever you want, but please label them clearly. I'll show you later why. Uh, references, I didn't put up links. Uh, it's either legal regulations, what you need, or it's GDPR which means uh, don't ask too much. That is a very, a very low level explanation. <laughs> I just don't want to get into, deep, uh, into detail here because that uh, is a never ending story. Um, but if, as soon as we have this thing with the, uh, with the required fields, we come to error messages. Error messages, nice funny thing. An error message. It tells me that something went wrong. It should tell me what went wrong. And it should also tell me what I can do against it or whether I can do something against it. In API design, if you return a 500 error, that means I'm quite sorry, I fucked up, but you as a user can't do anything about it. Fine, I know what I'm, what's going on. I can't do anything, might not even be my problem. Um, I'll give you an example. I try to enter this talk uh, for another conference. Uh, which one was it? Oh, PHP Serbia, I think. Um, and I, I entered my, the, the stuff in there, perfect, everything's fine, submit my talk, yes, I'm ready to go. No, I'm not. The first thing was, okay, if you have an error message, please, please do it in a way that one can read it actually. Um, but I'm not going to into, into detail on that. Um, okay, there was an error. I corrected that error that it, I was told here. And then I hit submit again and I got another error. What the hell? Really? Please, please, present all errors at once. I don't want to fix one error just to be reminded, oh, and you fucked up here as well. Oh, and here as well. And, oh, there as well. You know what? I'm going to buy somewhere else. Um, so please present all the errors at once and also please present them where they can be fixed. Makes it much easier for the user. Just a, round, a red border around the field here. Uh, this, is the, this is the problematic field. Please do this to fix that problem. And provide end user compatible messages. The regex slash 
blast of whatnot slash did not match. Yes, that's technically perfectly correct. But as a user, I, well, okay, I can understand it probably, but most of the users can't. <laughs> so use end user compatible error messages. Um, and also provide actionable error messages. You fucked up, yes, I know that. What can I do against it? Like, this is not the correct date format. Okay, I get that. What can I do to fix that? Oh, I have to add a zero in front of it. So tell me that. And the interesting thing was, I was looking for, for references for, for these error message things, and um, I came over a, a blog from 2008, that is 10 years ago, that mentioned all these things. So nothing has changed. Please, please, start. OK, one thing I've actually forgotten. When I register, well, OK, when I, when I uh, go to a shopping site and I'm doing my shopping, everything's fine. I'm, I get through with that. But when I want to register for GitHub, GitLab, Twitter, whatever, I need another thing, which is a required field in a way, which is a password. Well, what can I say about passwords? The easiest thing about passwords is try to avoid them. Not from a user perspective, but from your perspective. Because what you don't have, you can't lose. It's as easy as that. So if you are able to use external sources, like, for example, OAuth, or SAML, or LDAP, or Kerberos, or whatever, use them. Makes it easier for the users, because they don't have to remember 15 different passwords. And it makes it easier for you, because you don't have to remember a password at all, because you don't need to store it. You just request, uh, check with someone else, is that correct? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, if you do something like that, especially for OAuth, use different providers. Um, it's nice to have a Facebook login button, but there might be people that don't use Facebook. I I've heard that. Or there might be people that don't use Twitter. I had that uh, actually when I, uh, on, on php.ug, where people could log in only with Twitter. Yes, do as I say, not as I do. Um, and uh, someone contacted me from China, and they said, yeah, that's nice, but we can't log in because we don't have Twitter here. And I was like, oh, interesting. OK, so I should do something against that. Uh, and then I introduced GitHub login as well. So um, use different providers to make it easier for people. And if you have to do passwords, don't roll your own crypto. And so far, I didn't say a word about PHP. Now I'm going to say something about PHP. Because of course, we always hash passwords. And if so, we use the password hashing API in PHP, don't we? We do, yes. <laughs> um, and of course, avoid leaking uh, passwords in clear text. Uh, yes, of course, we, we, don't, we can't leak passwords in clear text because we, ha we only store the hashed value. That is correct, but think about the user enters the, uh, the, the password. And then the password gets transferred in clear text to your server. Well, encrypted by HTTPS, but still within that tunnel, it's in clear text. So your scripts get the password in clear text. And within your script, it's still possible to actually leak that password by weird mechanisms that I encountered in Magento, where you can hook into any function you want. And you can do anything with the input that comes into that function. Oh, interesting. I write a plugin that everyone uh, needs, like, what was that? Uh, left, what was that uh, NPM package? Left pad, exactly. Uh, that everyone needs on their Magento side, and suddenly I have all the passwords. Awesome. Think about stuff like that. And if you have passwords, don't force <coughs> passwords requirements apart from a minimum length. What? I, I give you something later. If people put in their password, show them some information about password quality. There aren't enough libraries around there. Um, encourage users to use a passphrase. So not just the eight characters or nine characters. Encourage them to use something longer, which is much easier to remember. 
and allow them to use password managers. Never, ever limit the password length. If you limit the password length, I have to think that you are storing my password in clear text. Because otherwise, when you are hashing my password, it has a fixed password length, no matter whether I enter 100 characters or 5. So if you require just between 8 and 16 characters of a password, oh, you're storing that in Varchar 16. Thank you. Um, and also, uh, for company stuff, uh, there's always this nice thing like, oh, you have to renew your password every two months. Ditch that. Um, because uh, what's going to happen is either the passwords uh, will be, uh, well, they, they have, a, have a scheme, so you can guess the password, or the password will be posted somewhere. Have a look at the monitor, have a look uh, under the uh, placemat, or have a look uh, in the uh, drawer. So don't do that. And I'm not the only one doing, uh, saying that. Um, you'll see that. And we probably all know this one, this XKCD. Uh, this Troubadour N3 is extremely hard to remember, at least for me. If it's easy to remember for you, that's fine. But it's very easy to crack, actually. But the uh, correct horse battery staple which is rather long. It only has characters. It only has undercase, uh, uh, lowercase characters. But that's much, much, much harder to guess for a computer. But it's much easier to remember for me as a person. Keep that in mind when you do some stuff with passwords. Some resources, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which uh, is the advisor to the NSA, for example, says exactly the stuff I've told you. The National Cybersecurity Center, which is uh, the, are the, perp, uh, the people advising the MI6, uh, do say that. Have a look at, at Have I Been Pawned. There are some uh, uh, libraries, uh, some packages, that you can even include in your password creation mechanism. So if someone enters a new password, you can verify whether the, that password is also, uh, already, has already been pawned and can tell the user, ah, you probably should use something else. Think about stuff like that. And having said people want to use a password manager, I have to tell you something about copy and paste. I think it's only one thing I have to tell you. Thou shalt not disable copy and paste, especially not on password fields. Because I want to paste them in, because I want to have secure passwords. And everyone who says, yeah, but when you can paste them in, then there might be a tracker that might be able to grab them from that field. Yeah, if you have a grabber on that computer, you have a completely different problem. And that is not yours. <laughs> um, yeah. Also, the National Cybersecurity Center uh, has a nice article on exactly that, um, which I linked there. So, but people tend, of course, to forget their passwords. It happens. So, what do most people use? They have a security question. Well, um, interesting thing. Try to avoid them. <laughs> and if you, if you need them, I mean, if, if it's a small company and uh, you have one or two people per year doing that, hey, let them phone you. It's cheaper than to develop all that stuff behind it. Um, if you have to use them, don't use predefined questions. Make up your own set of questions or let the people get, uh, think of questions. Because otherwise, well, uh, one of those security questions is uh, what car you, learned to, uh, you uh, learned to drive on. People are happily answering these things on Facebook, on Twitter, on whatever, or something like that. What was the name of your first pet? So thanks, uh, social media. Uh, I know all the passwords. No, I don't know all the passwords, but you get the picture. Uh, security questions are a backup password that is easier to remember as a than a password, which is kind of doesn't make sense. Well, Crips and Security wrote something about that. Have fun. And then, of course, we don't want bots, so we have to have a capture, don't we? Anything else? <laughs> um, 
in, in most of the captures, uh, or at least when you use reCAPTCHA, uh, we have to identify that we are a human person by knowing how a stop sign looks. Uh, does that make a Tesla a human person? Or any other automated driving car? Um, so captures are just ugly. They are not really nice looking. They are hard to read. Um, and they discriminate users with disabilities. Unless you have some advanced technique behind that you can request them to listen to something and enter the stuff or whatever. And they use the users as workforce. We, every time you don't solve a capture by not clicking all the stop signs, a Tesla will cause an accident. Well, kind of. You know, you know what I get at. Um, but still, we need some protection. So what are the alternatives? One of the alternatives is a honeypot. Who of you has heard of a honeypot? OK, so for the rest of us, a honeypot is a trap. It is a field that is within your form. And usually, the, uh, the, the spammers um, grab your form and see, oh, there is a field, so I enter something. But you require this field to be empty. So as soon as someone enters something, you know, <laughs> got you. That's spam, so just filter it out. Uh, there are a lot of, of libraries around to use that, something like that. There are simple math captures. What is 3 plus 5? They're easy to solve for most of the people. Well, you probably shouldn't ask for the square root of pi, but um, OK. And if it's about uh, uh, accessing stuff, use two-factor verification. Helps as well. And then I've, I stumbled upon Uncapture. Who of you has heard of that? That's a pretty awesome project. Um, they actually automatically solve reCAPTCHA by requesting the audible version of the CAPTCHA which comes from Google, feeding that to the Google key, uh, KI uh, to solve that, so they get, the, what, get back from Google what they have to type in there. Awesome project. I really like that. <laughs> yes, that's it. Any questions? Let's talk in the hallway. Short one. Uh, which brings, it, uh, brings us to an interesting thing. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, there was no sign. Was there a sign? Uh, the question was um, how to solve the problem that uh, we don't remember which third party uh, authentication service we used for a certain website. So uh, I can log in via Twitter, GitHub, whatnot. Uh, which one did I use here? Was it Twitter or was it GitHub? Oh, damn it. Um, one of the, the things I've seen so far was pretty interesting, um, which required you to use the same username on Twitter and GitHub. Um, but the, the, the idea is you, you distinguish between a login and a user account. So you can have multiple logins for one user account. And then it was like, oh. Could it be that we have uh, that you have logged in from Twitter, uh, and then please verify that you logged in via Twitter? And then, ah, yeah, okay, that's the same. And then you can log in via GitHub or Twitter in future times. So that would be a possibility. Uh, no, if you if you have to log in via Twitter afterwards, oh, yeah, yeah. it's not. Okay. It, of course, <laughs> otherwise it would be yes. Oh, thank you. We got your name. Is it possible that you are this person? Ah, uh, nope. <laughs> Probably not the best idea. <laughs> yeah, if, if you don't have any question, other questions now, thank you very much.